decorative arts. I'm really excited, uh, particularly for this month, because we have um, a lot of good Facebook Lives for Mesda and Old Salem and how we're dealing with um, furniture. So this whole month is about furniture. Um, and I'm really excited to sit back and listen to it. One of the things that uh, you'll notice uh, in the past 12 months is that um, the Museum of Early Southern Decorative Arts and Old Salem Museums and Gardens has really tried hard to unify our programming. And what's happening this month and really what's been happening for the last 12 months has been stepping us towards um, unifying not only the things that we do in our historic district as part of living history, but also doing what um, MESDA will perform in terms of programming. So um, we're really excited that today is a really strong example of that because um, we've got two of our experts. One of them is our um, chief curator, Daniel Ackerman, who will be speaking from the Museum of Early Southern Decorative Arts actually in the galleries. And then we have Ben Masterson, who's one of our uh, master craftsmen and also one of our education coordinators. And Ben will be speaking from one of our historic venues, which is the Bloom House. And so there's gonna be this conversation between a level of scholarship um, and artifact from MESDA with the actual hands-on um, and understanding of craftsmanship from the Bloom House and from Ben. So with that, I'm very excited to move on to this month's uh, programming and uh, today's discussion about ghost marks and the craftsman who actually um, did that. So let's move on to the actual program. Welcome. Is that me? Not yet. Okay. Okay. It's loading up. There you are, Ben. Cool. Hello, everybody. Good morning. So we're doing a lot of multimedia here, and so I'm going to be looking at my phone, and I can see Daniel there. This is perfect. One of our many galleries, Chris Cross Gallery, holds some of our earliest objects. Now, I just want to start off this morning by saying that. This is a big experiment for us. We've never attempted to do multiple locations at one time, but this is an example of how we're really experimenting with technology in an effort to connect people with our objects in new and different ways. And so, as President Frank said uh, this morning, I and Ben Masterson, our master joint, our education coordinator, are going to talk about furniture and tools and the hands that made it. So we're here at our 17th century furniture gallery in particular because this is a space filled with objects that really show um, the marks of the hands that made it. Um, and in particular, Ben and I uh, really wanted to begin with this object, which is called a pork cupboard. It's the oldest piece of furniture in Memphis collection in Jamestown. And, you know, Ben, a lot of the tools that were used to make this object aren't all that different from the tools you have in your shop. We're having a little bit of a technical thing on our end, so what I want to do, Ben, is ask you to perhaps take people on a quick tour of the Bloom House uh, and the kinds of woodwork is here. We're going to do and that's where the Bloom House and yeah. show some of the tools that we be used for the definitely so I think we're on air so go ahead okay hi everybody so we're in the bloom joinery and um, this is an early 19th century house but when we're talking about joinery here in Salem and down in Mazda you know we're spanning a few centuries so um, when we get back well Daniel's gonna get back into the 17th century up here I definitely get back into the 18th century but I think we're going to kind of take a look at this shop, um, and as soon as we can get back down to Mazda and join up with Daniel, we're going to do that as well. But I wanted to talk about some of the tools and some of the benches we have here. So I'm working on a Peterson bench, and Karsten Peterson was an early 19th century uh, cabinet maker from Denmark. And he had a couple of sons, and so they worked as a, a family over in the old slaughterhouse. Across the way, there was like an industrial district over there. 
And so we've got a whole bunch of original tools and original benches. And in our collection, we have a ton of Peterson furniture as well. He was very prolific. And so um, this bench was either one of his sons or his, and we made a reproduction of it. And I've also got one of his tools here, and we have a whole bunch of the tools, but I thought I'd just grab one today. You know, I was talking about we've got the bench, we've got the uh, furniture, we've got the tools, but then I've also got this letter as well. And so I just think it's such a cool thing. And I know, you know, it's a bit nerdy for a lot of people, but I think, I think people will appreciate this. So the letter is from um, Emmanuel Carpenter, and Carpenter is a great last name for, uh, for, for a tool maker, I think. And he's corresponding with Carson Peterson. And he's saying, I'm ill right now, but I'll get to making your molding planes as quickly as I can. I was a cabinet maker once. I know exactly what you want. So here, if we take a look, and I'll hold this up to the camera, and you let me know if you can see it. Um, it's stamped Lancaster, Pennsylvania, E.W. Carpenter, and this descended in the Peterson family. So that's one of the original tools there. Now, a couple of the other tools I thought we'd talk about real quick is um, the Seaver brothers. So the Seaver brothers were contemporaries of Peterson, and you've kind of got the old school here in town, which was the Single Brothers Joiners, which was this kind of heavy, Baroque, Germanic style. And then the Petersons and the Seavers, they're building in a much more contemporary style. Um, and like I say, that's kind of the first quarter into the first half of the 19th century. So this is a plane that we replicated and we use all the time. It's called a dovetail plane. And um, we use it for making sliding dovetail battens. But this belonged to the Seaver brothers. And to me, this is a particularly interesting story because the Seaver brothers in 1840 when times are getting a little bit lean here in Salem, they look for work elsewhere, and they travel over to Milton, North Carolina, and they work in the shop of Thomas Day. Thomas Day is a free black cabinet maker who has the most sophisticated modern shop in all of North Carolina during this time. So he's running a shop that's powered by steam, and it's what we call a line shaft shop. So you've got pulleys all over the place, and then you've got these belts, and these belts are coming down. And they're running tools that you know, look pretty modern for the area, you know, table saws and band saws and um, joiners and things like that. So the Seaver brothers, John and Jacob, they go work with Thomas Day for a while, I think probably about the span of two years. So you know that they're bringing back a lot of that influence here to Salem. But also, when we start digging through, and we're looking at the, um, uh, we're looking at the census, um, we see that there's three enslaved people who are owned by John Seaver, one of the brothers. And the names are William, Tom, and Richard. And so when we look at these tools, and when we look at the furniture being built by the Seaver brothers, we can pretty much assume that it's also being built by William, Tom, and Richard. And after emancipation, um, Tom is also listed on the census is still being a cabinet maker. So there's a tradition of enslaved cabinet makers here in town as well. Enslaved and free, of course. But so the dovetail plane, um, if we can, Samantha, I don't know if it's too complicated. I'll tell you what, I'll move the chair over here. I think it's easier, yeah. So I'll show you what that plane was actually used for. Um, I've got what we call a board back chair, and a lot of people call it a Moravian board back chair because um, it's a popular thing amongst woodworkers because it's such a cool construction, the Moravian's pretty well known for it. So this one, I'm gonna find a safe way to set it down because this is actually an 18th century, oh, come around this way? Cool. It's an 18th century uh, chair, and this one was made by Moravians, but it was actually made up in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. Uh, so when I was showing you that sliding dovetail plane, what that's doing is it's carving uh, this little dovetail wing on these battens here. So I'll carve out those battens, and then I, ride, I route out this channel. First thing I would do is I'd saw down to make those two wings, and then route it out with a router plane, not a modern router plane. I can show you the one we'd use in just a second. But then you insert these battens, and for a chair, it's really just for stability but we'll put them on huge tables as well. So if you've got this massive, expansive, wide table and you've got all these seasonal changes in the wood where the wood is swelling and it's contracting and it's moving back and forth, those sliding dovetail battens keep it flat so it allows for it to breathe and it can swell and shrink without cracking typically. 
Um, but it also keeps it from warping and distorting. So that's what the dovetail plane is for. Um, and then with this particular chair, you know, we're talking about tool marks today. So I, I've made a few of these. And if we take a look at the underside of this, a lot of times, especially with colonial furniture, when you look at the undersides, and, and we'll jump on this with Daniel, so I won't talk too much about it because you'll see it first. Daniel, I think he's ready to Oh, good. This. Perfect. Perfect. Hey, Ben, can you hear me? Can you see me? Is he there? Yes. Oh, good. Hey. Okay. Ben. Hello, Neil. Hey, it's so good to see you. Um, and I heard you talking about Thomas. Unfortunately, Hitt, I can't I hear him. Why not? come out to actually one of our real treasures, this this dressing bureau He's made by Thomas Day. Oh, um, okay, cool. You know, and, and you're talking about, you know, the importance of movement and stuff. So I've got a question for you, Ben. Um, okay. You know, a drawer like this, which is, you know, obviously just sort of a box, but is veneered on the front, um, you know, you talk about things moving over time. I mean, how does a cabinet maker work to, to deal with the fact that all this wood, you know, wants to move in its own strange directions over time? I'm sorry, Daniel. I wasn't able to hear you earlier, and I just put a pair of headphones on. Ask him to restate the question about the drawer. Mm -hmm. So if you could restate that last question. Sure, Ben, sure. So. You know, I'm thinking about our example of Thomas furniture here, because you were talking about Thomas Day and the Severs brothers, and you were yeah. talking about how wood moves and changes over time and things like sliding, sliding dovetails, for example. And I was curious, yeah. you know, how does a cabinet maker uh, account for that, for things like veneers that, that are moving in so many different directions at once? Yeah, that's a great question. Well, I'm going to just pull the headphones off because I've got a little bit of delay, but veneer is a great thing for movement because you're really making plywood of that time period. So the more layers you can glue together, the more stable it's going to be and the less it's going to react to its environment. Um, you know, but during that time period, you're using hide glue and hide glue is very soluble with water. So that's the one thing we see on, and I'm sure you see it all the time with a lot of the furniture down there, is that... Um, you'll have delamination because that hide glue is going to get moist over time just with the humidity in the air and then it starts to delaminate and that can be a really tricky thing to have to repair um, but you know by the time thomas day is building he's pretty darn sophisticated uh, with the way he's building and he's building pretty heavy duty that style of furniture is pretty chunky um, it's almost architectural in a lot of ways so i think that kind of contributes to the stability too and then I can see there too, Daniel, he's got the, um, the bottom of the drawer, it looks like, is let in. And I can't quite see if it's a raised panel. Oh, it is. Cool. It is. Yep. So Just it's open. let into that groove. And so there you've got that guy kind of floating around in there for the most part. And that's the way chairs are made. That's the way doors are made. Um, that's the way lots of things are shutters. They have that floating panel. So there's a little bit of a wiggle room. So it's not going to force those dovetails apart on the side. Very cool, Ben. Very cool. What was that last thing you said there, Daniel? I just said very cool, Ben. I mean, you know, we think about these things being sort of, you know, solid and locked in place. And yet there's a lot of thought that goes into the fact and a lot of special tools that go into the fact uh, sort of how to make this. I wonder if you might, um, you might show our folks, um, you know, some of these things in action. Yeah, definitely. Um, do you want to talk about how to make a raised panel, or what would you like to talk about? How we cut a yeah, dovetail? Yeah, would be absolutely great. I mean, we're going to go try to walk actually towards some raised panels. Um, and if we lose, if you lose me again, you know, Ben, you get those planes out, start making some wood shavings. Um, but yeah, raised panels are a seriously cool thing because you know, as you were saying, it's all about how do you keep wood moving over time and so um, it's one of those really fundamental parts of construction so why don't you show our, our audience how you do some raised panels and and way and i are going to go find a piece of furniture in our collection that really demonstrates them in action that sounds perfect daniel all right so i'm going to grab a couple tools here 
you know, if I was making a raised panel um, in the early days of Salem, like if the Single Brothers joiners were making a raised panel, versus if Karsten Peterson in the 19th century is making a raised panel, it's a, it's a different, it's a different um, way of doing it. And I think we're going to look at some early ones that Daniel's got over there that are fairly crude. And it almost looks like they're doing even the decorative raised panel just with probably a chisel and um, maybe a, a real simple plane. But a lot of times what I'll do is I'll use a plane to kind of start the whole thing. And this is going to give me the field, the raised field. So you usually have that re rectangular bit in the middle and then it tapers away from it. So that guy is really, you can set up the fence um, to locate the cut within the wood. So I can move that body of the plane back and forth and then for this one too, it's a little bit later, so I can actually set up the depth as well. Um, it's got a foot there, and so if I screw it down, um, it's gonna raise that foot, so I can set it to stop the depth I want. So I've got a board locked in, just a little tulip poplar board here, and I'll run it across, and I'm defining where that uh, field is gonna be, and then, like I say, I can set the depth so it doesn't go too deep. And we could probably say that's good right there. And then I would do is figure out, depending on how sophisticated this thing needs to be, if it's going to be the underside of a drawer, it certainly doesn't need to be sophisticated at all. You know, I could just rough it out with a jack plane super fast. But um, if I want it to be real refined looking, I'd probably set up a depth of that taper as well with a little marking plane, with a marking gauge rather. And it's got a scribe on it, a little nicker or a nail. And I set that distance of the depth, and I just draw it back. And we get that defined, and then I can start knocking that wood off. And it's a fair amount of wood, so I would probably, if I can do it safely, I would probably start with a scrub plane. And I'll show you that scrub plane in just a second. And I think we'll be looking at some scrub plane marks on some other pieces of furniture as well. And the scrub is really aggressive. It's really, it's kind of a workhorse. Um, yeah, that's one of the things that you see uh, that's a little bit different here at Old Salem and Mesta. Well, not necessarily Mesta because they've got, you know, wonderful furniture from all over the place. But if you go up to Williamsburg, they typically aren't starting with a scrub plane. They're starting with a jack plane, which is just kind of a bigger version. But this guy being so small and so narrow with the mouth wide open and a really aggressive, um, aggressive sweep to that blade, it's going to scoop out a lot of wood in a short amount of time. So come back and just start hogging wood off. But I can't get too close to the field with it because the sole of the plane stops on either side of the throat, so, or the mouth of it, I should say. So when I get down to um, some good depth there. I'm gonna go back to a skewed rabbit plane and I can sneak in quite a bit closer because the blade runs right up to the edges of that plane and you can see where the mouth travels all the way across and the throat is wide open to both sides. Now the tricky thing about these planes, especially old ones, is that you've only got this bit of wood up here holding it together and so it tends to warp, you know, so this one's one that we made, and it's still fairly aligned, but the old ones tend to wander a little bit, so you have to trim them up again. But I can run that point pretty much right up to that dado I made. And I'm gonna make that guy a little bit more aggressive just by tapping on the blade, tightening up the wedge, and get in there and start to take it right up to my field. All right, so that would be the way I'd do it probably in the 18th century, around here anyhow. Um, but, you know, as tool makers are, as tools are becoming more available, you know, in the 18th century, a lot of times we're buying our tools getting shipped all the way from England. But then you've got a lot of places in Pennsylvania um, and places like Baltimore that are, are, you know, start cranking out a ton of tools. And so they become readily available and you get to a panel raising plane like this guy. So this guy's gonna do pretty much all the things I need it to do. And if you look at the profile, you can actually see where it flattens out as well. So it's gonna give me the, um, the chamfer, that bevel coming down, 
and then it's also going to flatten out at the bottom and leave a tongue all the way around. So when it goes into the groove in the door or in the shutter, it's got that flat bit. The early ones would come to a point on the edges. So the edges would just be triangular shape, and then that gets slid into the styles and rails and it floats in there. So I think until Daniel can connect again, let's go yeah. back to that. He's back on? Yeah. Oh, okay. Let's come talk. Okay. Good. Hey, Ben. Good to see you again. Um, so I am here in our crisscross gallery with one of the pieces of furniture you and I talked about the other day, which is the court cupboard, which uses some of those techniques involving raised panels, but also has a whole bunch of other techniques involved as well, um, particularly when it comes to another kind of tool, the lathe. And you and I were looking at this the other day, and so interesting how these turned elements, you know, are just sort of nailed on. I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about how this kind of, um, this kind of turning is done and as well. Something like this. I mean, how do you turn uh, um, something in sort of a column? Yeah, definitely. Those split balusters are really cool. Um, and so are those little applied finials. And what do, you, what do you call those, Daniel? The little applique thing? I, I call them bosses, you know, sort of applied bosses. And you asked me the other day, how were they put on there? And, and I realized I hadn't looked very closely, and then I realized, you know, we're talking about how wood changes and moves over time, how, you know, in fact, they're just nailed right on, and you see this crack here, um, you know, they, the nails used to put those on are directly responsible for that giant crack along that, uh, that piece of wood. Yeah, no doubt. Nails don't move very well. No, no, but they do help to sort of, uh, wedge apart the grain of a piece of wood like this. I mean, this is, this is really early growth, we call southern yellow pine. So super straight grain. It's hard to see the grain now because of 360-year-old piece of furniture. There's a lot of dark pigmented wax, but, you know, originally you would have seen these really bold sort of orange-yellow, we like little bacon stripe almost kind of grain. And, and boy, those nails, they just... They just push that grain apart over, you know, a few centuries. Yeah, that's a tricky thing with southern yellow pine is that, you know, you've got the, you've got the different growth rings in there. So you've got the dormant, um, or I should say you've got the spring growth, and then you've got the later growth in the season. And so it goes hard, soft, hard, soft, and it tends to be really splitty. It wants to split on those really different um, densities of growth rings for sure. But yeah, all those applied decorations are really cool. And so with those split balusters, you know, if I were to do it, and I think probably how that person did it as well, is you would start off with square stock and take um, two boards, glue it together in the middle, and you would glue it together with hide glue, but I would also put a piece of paper to separate those. So when it came time to pull them back apart, it'd be really easy to pull them back apart. Um, the cool thing about that seam too is that it locates the center of the block wood you're gonna be turning. So even if you've got two boards that aren't perfectly symmetrical, um, you're going to take a divider and you're basically going to pivot from the center of that seam in a circle and then throw that guy on the lathe, you know, drill a little hole on either side, throw it up on the lathe, turn it out, and then once you've got it turned out, um, hide glue can be popped back apart with just a little bit of force. So you could take a chisel, get it in there, and probably pop it apart that way. If you had to use moisture, you could, but I don't think you would have to do it for that. Um, I think the trick there is to mix your hide glue strong enough so it doesn't fall apart on the lathe, and mix it thin enough so you can pop the darn things back apart again. You know, and you and I were talking about those, those bosses, Daniel, and um, I was thinking, you know, the easiest way to do it, to mass produce them, would be to turn them out on one cylinder, and then you would face turn it. So basically, like, if um, this was the face of the cylinder, you would just keep turning on the face of it, and then cut off those little cookies, and you'd have a ton of them. But I don't think those would have been done that way because I think the end grain would split right through. So those were probably turned as a disc rotating more like this with the long grain going that way. And, and if you want, um, we can, as, you, as we look at it, I can pop over to the uh, turning shop. We can take a look as well. 
That would be awesome, Ben. I mean, just to, I think it's so much fun to think about these things and the tools that were being used 350 years ago and really try to connect those to the, to the shop practices that we do today because, you know, really the, the tools and technologies that were involved in making this in Jamestown in 1650 aren't all that different from the tools and technologies that you use um, to sort of represent um, craft traditions here in Salem in the first half of the night. Yeah, and something that, you know, I was thinking about when we were going to talk about this piece of furniture is, were they using a treadle lathe when they were doing that? Or were they using a spring pole lathe? And I honestly don't know. They would have um, known about the technology and had the technology to, bring, to build a treadle lathe, but spring pole lathes, you know, I've been around for, oh gosh, you know, since early Middle Ages, and they're really easy to build. So I just don't know. I mean, it's possible it would have been a treadle lathe. Da Vinci draws the treadle lathe with a big flywheel, circa 1500. Um, they're, they're really used by metal workers in the early days, and then they catch on with woodworkers a little later on. But the spring pole lathe is ubiquitous. English bodgers are making their living on spring pole lathes out in the woods up until you know recent times and so this one that i work on is one that we own it's in our collection we made a reproduction of it and it's this really great massive germanic lathe and it's got two rods in the back so what i do is i step down and it spins the wood when i let go it's gonna those two springs in the back just spin it back to where we started so it's slow going the rpms are, are low um, you know, but it gets the job done. It doesn't do quite as refined of a job as what a treadle lathe would do, but yeah, I would, I would love to know. I think what I really like too are those little eggs, those decorations on there, because I think you could do those in series. Yeah, those, those are really great, you know, so if I was turning those guys, what I would do is I would just turn one after another and I would get them fairly small. Oh, I don't have the sound there very good. And I would just keep running those down the same piece of wood. And then when I got them very, very close, I would just start to sever them off. And then I would have to advance this puppet, which this is here, the tailstock. Uh, center it again, advance it, move it forward, and make another one and do them all in series. All right, what else do you have to show me there, Daniel? Well, I, I thought maybe we'd talk a little bit about saws, and different kind of saws. I mean, you know, in the antiques trade, people think about circular saw marks, and those are instantly, oh, that's late, that's old. Nothing was mechanically done. One of the things I think is really cool about this object, we're gonna move to the other side of it, and I brought a light uh, to show this, because, you know, we talk about ghost marks, and here, how backboards are sawn in a very regular way, uh, suggesting that, you know, some kind of, of technology, probably a water-powered saw, we know they had water-powered saws at Jamestown in the 17th century, but, you know, also just compared to modern woodworking, there's sort of minimal attention paid to, to finishing these surfaces. I mean, it's, they, this is not meant to be seen by the public, and so it's just sort of, um, you know, left there. Yeah, I love that sort of thing. You know, you really, um, you, when you start poking around, it's like poking around in the attic of a house uh, where you get into these unfinished spaces, and then you start to see the anatomy of things. And, you, and then you can really, you know, it's like, um, I guess it's go, like going through somebody's laundry or something like that. You start seeing the secrets, you know, because they didn't intend you, for you to be looking at that. So they didn't pay a lot of attention to it. And that's where you can yeah, see, what? yeah, they were using a water-powered sash saw mill. And like, okay, so how do we differentiate between um, a water-powered sash saw versus a pit saw? And I think you would see more irregularity, like you were talking about, it's very regular um, as far as those striations going straight across it. But I think with a pit saw, you're gonna have more changes in angles with the guy up above and the guy down below moving that saw at different angles. And so you end up having this cross hatching that happens. 
So, um, you know, like you're saying, there's, and I, I'm sure most of the people watching know this already, but, you know, a lot of people see a circular saw mark and they think, wow, this must be really old, when in fact, you know, circular saws are, are quite a bit newer and more contemporary technology than, the, than a water-powered sash saw. And a water-powered sash saw is really just this big whip saw being um, driven by a, a wheel straight up and down and the log is being carried through it and sometimes it can be a gang of several sashes and so you're cutting several boards at the same time. Very cool. I want to show everybody one more thing that you and I noticed the other day just sort of up in here. Uh, so you know this the core cupboard is all joined together so mortises, tenons, and then peg and I just think it's so interesting to see you know in 1650 those pegs were put in and they weren't meant to be seen, so they weren't cut off, they weren't dressed, they're just, they're just there. Yeah, and, and that's, that's another one of those things that I love to see. And um, you know, even just looking at the way they uh, brought the end of their peg to a point is, is interesting, you know. You can see, oh, well, they used a gouge as kind of scallops marks rather than just flat marks. They might have used a, a gouge. And sometimes, too, you'll see where those pegs get driven through on the inside and they blast out the inside of that leg, which I think we see on that. And when you and I were looking at that, we couldn't tell if, if those, um, the top of those legs were pared down for aesthetics or if maybe uh, that would have been you know, blasted out and then just pared down later. I see this question come up. How big of a water source would be necessary for a water-powered saw? That's a really great question. There's tons of creeks around here. And, um, you know, some of them are pretty bold, but they would make races, you know, so when they talk about a race, it's, they're basically narrowing down um, a channel of water coming from that creek, and that's going to increase the pressure being exerted on the water wheel. But if there's still not enough pressure, then you would do an overshot wheel where the race is coming down a trough and it's, it's hitting the top of the wheel. So it's got more drop and it's more power. That's a great question. Hey. Ben, I thought maybe we would go and look at, uh, sort of go forward a century or so and come out here into our Masterworks gallery and look at a couple other things. Um, you know, I think a key tool for any cabinet maker are, of course, their chisels, right? I mean, you've been turning, showing us some work on the lathe and that those use particular kinds of chisels. But, you know, when we look at so many of the objects out here, we're really seeing that kind of technology. I and mean, this is one of the the great example of carving, you know, here. Um, tell us a little bit more about, you know, the sort of chisels and gouges and other tools like that that you work with in the shop. Yeah, definitely. Well, honestly, you know, I'm more, here in Salem, um, you had, you didn't have as much divisional labor, I should say that. So a cabinet maker and a joiner might be one and the same. Um, but, you know, you see, you see a more divisional labor in larger cities. So a joiner would be doing like more utilitarian things and a cabinet maker would be doing fine things. That's definitely, obviously, an extremely fine piece of furniture. Far finer than anything I've, I've made in this shop. But if I were to guess, what I would do is I would cut the circular shape of that top. And Daniel, is that one piece of mahogany? That is, Ben. That is one piece of mahogany. It's just massive, it's really impressive. So I would cut that circle and then I would take a cutting gauge and I would follow all the way around that circle, um, you know, so to define what's going to be risen, you know, that pie crust on the outside, all, all the things that are gonna be carved. And then I would probably just go after the inside of it with maybe a scrub plane if it wasn't too aggressive and if the wood was reacting in a decent way and it wasn't chipping and tearing. So you're planing that whole field within that raised um, crust, but then as you get up close to your decorations, you're gonna have to finesse in there with just chisels. And, and it's just so, that's the beautiful thing about that table, is that it's one flat plane going right up to that beautifully intricately carved border. That border isn't applied to it. That border is a relief, you know, it's rising up from that, um, that plane. So someday I'll, I'll build that table, but not, not today, that's for sure. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm also curious, I mean, a big part of this is cleaning up that field, removing all that wood, but sandpaper, I mean, we use sandpaper for everything today. 
Sandpaper's a relatively recent introduction. I mean, what are the tools available to an 18th century or even 19th century woodworker to get that kind of super smooth finish? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, and there's a lot of tricks. There's a lot of ways to get to that finish. And sometimes the wood is super cooperative and sometimes it's not cooperative. And sometimes you're picking extremely uncooperative wood because it's so beautiful. Yeah, you have a piece yeah, there, yeah. Daniel? Yeah. This, you know, I mean, they obviously picked this cherry because it has grain going in all those directions. But we were talking earlier about the fact that it's so beautiful, but there are a lot of physics at play there. Yeah, the, the light is being refracted from that in, because the grain is really squirrely. And so it's going to plane like it looks. Um, it's not going to plane in this long, flat, even, homogenous way. It's going to plane in this really toothy, chewy way, and it's going to want to tear. So um, let's quickly go over to the other room, and let's take a look at some of those tools that I'd use to tackle that and some of the technology that was available. Okay. So I would start with, um, you know, just getting it as smooth as I can with the planes I have. And if I can get all the way, great. But I'll, have to, I'll probably have to plane it askew. And so instead of just plowing into that wood and lifting up all those irregularities, what I'm doing is I'm, I'm turning it at askew and it's slicing more like a scissors. So that can get me a little bit closer. And then if that works out pretty good, but I have a little bit of tear out, what I would do is I would go on to a scraping card. And um, scraping is a really efficient way to smooth the wood down. So, you know, you could buy sandpaper by the late 1700s or early 1800s, but it's expensive and it gets worn out. You throw it away, you buy more. Um, but scraping, what we do is we roll a little burr on the edge of a piece of spring steel. So it's really, it's the same steel as what you would use in a panel saw. So it's made on a roller mill. And um, high carbon steel, we use a burnisher. And we roll that edge up and there's two little microscopic crowns. And then you take and you flatten those down. When you flatten them down, it's going to roll a burr over and you can feel it with your finger. And it's real small, but it cuts the wood almost like a plane, like a tiny plane. And so you can see. This one is not tuned up super great. When they're tuned up really great, they'll actually give you little ribbons and shavings. And this one's actually giving me sawdust, but that's okay, because it's still smoothing out the wood. Now, I do this more for tang than flat work, but you can also use equisetum. And equisetum is a reed um, that grows just wild by the creeks around here. It's a really cool prehistoric reed. Um, in the wild, it just grows huge but it picks up a lot of silica as it grows. And so you can take that and you can burnish the wood and get a, a light sanding with that as well. Typically you're gonna do that probably in more detailed spots that you really can't get into and scrape all that well. Now the other thing I would do is, especially with veneer or highly figured wood like that, is I would use a toothing plane. So I'm gonna grab a toothing plane from the other bench. I mean, you say a toothing plane, Ben. I mean, it, instead of trying to get the wood completely flat, what it's trying to do is actually sort of rough up the surface a little bit. Oh. And um, the toothing plane has all these serrations. I don't know if you can see it. I'm going to knock it apart so you can actually see. And that blade is set into the, um, the plane almost straight up and down. It's not totally perpendicular to the body of it, but it's darn close. And so it's scraping more than it's cutting. Um, and if you look, the back of it has all of these tiny serrations. So you sharpen it just like a regular plane, but you don't flatten the back. And then those serrations uh, continue to the cutting edge. So when I run that across the wood, if I've got really figured grain that just will not uh, you know, cooperate and it tears out with everything I do. Then I'm going to run that toothing plane. 
and it's going to leave all of those little tear marks, but they're so shallow that they can be scraped out after you get everything flattened. And if we were to look at the back of those veneers, um, they're also toothing the back of the veneer and the substrate wood or the secondary wood to make a really grippy glue surface as well. Which, which again, going back, we were talking about at the very beginning, is so important because wood is a natural material. It's expanding, it's contracting, and you're trying to dissipate those forces. And so having that surface, preparing it correctly, you know, that's, that's critical to making sure that furniture lasts, you know, long enough to end up in a museum. Yeah, definitely. You know, I think you have to be a certain sort of, I don't know, you, Luddite, I guess, in some ways, to work with wood. Wood is an amazing thing as far as um, the feel of it and just how it responds to tools. And that, that unpredictability is actually really intriguing as well. You know, it's, it's, it's kind of this little bit of alchemy that you have to factor into when you're building something. Um, but that, I mean, there's nothing that you, there's no other thing, material, that feels as comfortable as wood. So, you know, so we go through the process and, and we make it work the best we can. Well, so Ben, um, before we start wrapping up, I did want to ask, um, probably Samantha's paying attention to this. Um, do we have any questions from our audience that we should, um, we should answer? I saw, I'm watching the Facebook feed here. I saw one person who's saying hello to us from Milton, which is such a great town. Of course, Milton is where Thomas Day had his workshop. But um, are there any questions from our audience? Can you see questions coming up? I don't know, Daniel. I, I don't see anything coming up right now. We've, we've, we've either done an incredible job or confused everybody. But, um, <laughs> you know, Ben, I, I really just want to say thank you to you and um, Way, our manager of digital production, and Samantha Smith, our community engagement director. Um, and everybody else for you know being part of this sort of first eyes on Salem focus on furniture here in March. I mean, furniture making is such uh, an important part of everything we do here. Uh, it's so critical to our mission, preserving these skills, but also using them as a way of of, of teaching um, subjects that you know initially may not have anything to do with with history, but math science, technology, all of those things. And so, um, you know, I appreciate everybody's help putting this together because this really is the first of four Eyes on Salem that are going to really try to draw out those connections between the objects here in the museum and the work that you and your fellow education coordinators do out there in our workshops, uh, both here in Salem, but also really, you know, worldwide through our our various social media. So I appreciate that. And of course, if you want to learn more about all of our um, projects, our Learning in Place videos, Eye on, Eyes on Salem, and all of the other programs we have coming up, you know, they can do that at our website, oldsalem.org uh, and nesbit.org. I think we have some questions. Absolutely, oh, Daniel. Questions. I wonder, do you have a couple uh, moments for these last questions that are coming in? Uh, we absolutely do. Absolutely. See, I knew I just needed to stall just long enough, and we get some good questions. Um, so I've got one about, uh, could you chat a bit more about the distinctive Thomas Day construction features? And, you know, that's a great question. Part of it's sort of a curatorial answer. Part of it's a craftsperson answer. From the, from the curatorial perspective, you know, Thomas Day is master of a very large workshop. And so, um, you know, there are individual things about his work that, that seem very typical of his shop, particularly the carving, some of the finish techniques. But, you know, Ben, Day is also one of the first people to really move into mechanized production. So that has a big impact on how his work might have differed from somebody like, say, the Seavers here in Salem, who are working in a, in a similar style, but, you know, they're not using steam power technology, right? Yeah, definitely. I think, you know, I'm not um, a, a Thomas Day scholar, unfortunately. My friend Jerome Bias is, and, and Jerome, gosh, he's, he's the person to ask, and there's a couple other people here, 
in the area that are just really brilliant about Thomas Day's work. But Thomas Day also, the thing that really intrigues me about the stuff that he did is he did a lot of architectural things um, in houses. So you see fireplace mantles. I mean, you might come across a Thomas Day house where you know he really was the he was a master of like the whole interior decoration, and, and it might even be some outside fenestrations as well. But they're really, um, I, I guess for a lack of a better word, they're idiosyncratic. He's doing things that are extremely unique that you don't see other people doing during the time period. So things like newel posts, he's famous for newel posts. They're just, um, they're, they, it's hard to describe them, really organic nature. Um, sometimes he'll do, figureheads on either side of the mantelpiece. I mean, very almost, so a lot of his stuff is, you know, this very accurately rendered, oh, there's a beautiful one. Go ahead and talk about that, Daniel. Yeah, I mean, I think most people associate Day most with his really elegant carved work, which um, has its own distinct flavor. You know, what, what I'll also add uh, from sort of the curatorial perspective is, you know, because Day is running what was really the largest cabinet shop in North Carolina in 1850, you know, he's making a huge quantity of furniture. And so for us, it's so important to have a documentation, whether it's that we know an object was in a house in Milton that was constructed by Day, or in the case of this piece, you know, we actually have the original bill of sale. We have the receipt in Thomas Day's hand for it um, because he is producing so much so much furniture. I'll also, you know, Day tends to, because he has access to to steam power, you know, he's finishing his surfaces to perhaps a somewhat higher level than a lot of other craftsmen would have time. Remember, you know, time is money. It's labor. Taking a, a piece of lumber and, and and spending a lot of time making every single surface absolutely perfect. If you're not going to see that surface, it's not worth doing in a hand tool only workshop. But the moment you have access to power tools, you know, it becomes easier to do that. I think I'm sure we have some um, woodworkers watching us today who are thinking, well, you know, I make sure that every single surface I, I have is, is perfect. Well, you know, it's easier to do that with table saws and planers and whatnot. Uh, and I think with Day's work, because he really is among the first to embrace those technologies, he's able to do that in a much better way. Um, I think we have another question here. Um, and let's see, what, um, were toothing planes made in North Carolina? That's a, that's a really good question. Ben, I mean, where were these tools coming from? Yeah, well, you know, in the colonial period, we're buying most of these tools from England. Um, and England is just renowned for superior steel. So, and they really, they go through an industrial revolution before we do. So that's where a lot of the tools are coming at that. But then... You have places like, uh, I said before, you've got places like Philadelphia and Baltimore that um, are tooling up and coming up with great manufacturing. And they're building a lot of tools. By the time you get to Thomas Day's era, the, you start seeing tools popping up in the Great Lakes region as well. Tools made in North Carolina, toothing planes made in North Carolina, that's a very good question. And I honestly don't know if uh, tool manufacturing, hand tool manufacturing, was ever really much of an industry here, and, and I suspect it probably wasn't, but I could be totally wrong. And if somebody else can um, chime in on that, I'd love to know. But I think it's mostly like, like I say, up, up along the um, northeastern seaboard and, and into the Great Lakes region. Very good, very good. So, just. Um not sure if we have any other questions. I'm monitoring Facebook here, but I know Samantha probably has the ability to see a few other streams as well. Um, yeah, I can see a couple of questions coming in here. There's one that says, is it safe to assume that high-end craftsmanship of these periods would have had some element of enslaved work associated with the artifacts? And, um, and do you want to talk about Thomas Day's shop and the nature of what's going on with, with slavery then? Oh, absolutely. I mean, so we know Thomas Day's shop, um, you know, is interesting in that it does have both free and enslaved black labor. But the reality is that, um, you know, there's virtually no object um, made in the antebellum, not just South, but antebellum America more generally, it doesn't have a connection. We know, for example, through our Craftsman database, that there are hundreds of enslaved um, woodworkers. 
and you know how we categorize those woodworkers cabinet maker versus um, um, carpenter versus joiner yeah I think that's more about our own categories necessarily than, than what they were in the period but you know the the amount of labor required to transform a, a tree um, into a piece of furniture I mean these shops are at some point in the journey of that tree from you know being down to being delivered to a, a customer's house there's absolutely enslaved labor and in fact um, the the piece over here the um, Robert Walker tea table is actually a really good example of that because um, we actually know Walker in his shop had enslaved cabinet makers he was even training um, enslaved individuals as uh, apprentices there's actually an apprenticeship agreement uh, in which he agrees to take on both um, a young free white man and an individual enslaved by him whose name was Muddy uh, and he promises to teach them both the art and mystery of cabinet making and we should keep in mind the fact that um, you know for for somebody who is an enslaver um, having somebody in their shop with the skill to do work um, of any kind uh, but any kind of skilled work you know that that adds a lot of value and so um, you know the the connection of craft and trade and, and enslavement is a really important one I'm glad somebody asked that question um, and it's something that we are really looking very closely at and have been for a very long time through the work of our craftsman database but also through new interpretive models that um, you know begin to try to reunite the names behind the labor that made these objects with with these objects yeah definitely i think that's a great answer daniel and i was talking about this a little bit earlier um i just wanted to jump back on it just for a quick second just to um, be able to say their names again but this plane is marked jacob sievers but we know that the siever brothers owned three enslaved men and um, their names were William, Tom, and Richard. And after emancipation, Tom continues as a cabinet maker. And you see that here in Salem where there's really the struggle where the Moravians are engaging in slavery and they have enslaved people, but they're also trying to practice this medieval guild system. And so they have um, European apprentices and they don't want the enslaved craftsmen to compete with the apprentices. And so they start, they try to relegate enslaved labor basically to more common labor. But as you look in the records, people are getting in trouble in shops all the time for constantly bringing in enslaved craftsmen. Um, in fact, down at the gun shop, Timothy Vogler is one of uh, the most renowned uh, gun, gun makers here in the Piedmont. And his apprenticeship for a while, his father was for whatever reason, he was, it seems like he was unwell enough to be able to teach his son. So he actually brings on, and I don't know if he was renting uh, an enslaved person as a day laborer, but he brings on an enslaved person to tutor his son to teach him gunsmithing until the church finds out what's going on. And then he's, and then he's kind of ordered to remove this enslaved person from the community. So enslaved craftsmen are all over all of this furniture no doubt no doubt well i i think just the beginning of a much larger more important conversation that we're really having you know throughout our organization is we um, we search not just for the hidden town here but the hidden towns everywhere and as i said you know really trying to think about these objects and credit all of the individuals behind them and sort of recognize and acknowledge um, all of their stories, all of their, um, all of their work, all of their skills and talent. So um, you know, before we sign off, Ben, I just wanted to ask if we have any more questions. Yeah, I've got another one for you here, Daniel. So it says, in your personal opinion, where is your favorite furniture produced and why? That's one for you. Well, that's a dangerous question. I guess I guess part of the answer is uh, who's currently watching this and where do they live? Um, you know, Mezda action that spans seven states and that's like having seven children. You love them all uh, equally but differently. Um, 
so much of my own work centers on early Kentucky. So of course I have a really special place in my heart for the pieces made, made there. But, um, you know, I think what I appreciate most is how each of these objects really speaks to the uniqueness of the um, individual places they're made. So, so how's that for a non-answer answer? answer? <laughs> That's a great answer. Um, you know, and honestly, I would have to answer that my focus be, being in the shop here is usually Moravian furniture uh, of the Piedmont, of the Wachovia, but it just depends on, on what I've seen most recently that has really excited me. And it changes all the time, you know, but I, I tend to like kind of folksy stuff. I, I like um, more of the layman type furniture, things that aren't rendered perfectly, um, that didn't come out of maybe an established. So backcountry stuff really intrigues me. I guess that'd be my answer. Well, and, and I always love things that really have great stories to tell. So like this, this desk and bookcase, um, you know, the fact that it was owned originally by a watchmaker who put little tiny hooks on the pigeonholes so that he could hold um, watch parts as he was working on them. I mean, that's the kind of little thing that um, so fun and interesting. So, you know, uh, great craftsmanship, great materials, a great story to tell. Um, all those things come together. Well, I've got a couple comments that I'll read to you quickly, Daniel. Um, so Dale Ausherman says, thank you, Daniel and Ben. Nice to done an enjoyable and educational contribution to my Friday. Michael Phillips says, thanks for the insights. The dressing bureau has such distinctive carving. Amazing to have the original receipt. Indeed, I mean, we're, we're so lucky to have that object. And, um, you know, Ben, we're really lucky to have you you and your talent. I like to joke that, you know, um, don't, you know, you, if you can't create, you curate. And so I just feel so fortunate to get to work with people like you who actually understand how to put their hands and how to transform, um, how to transform materials like wood into furniture like this. And um, I really appreciate you taking the time today to, to join me for this sort of two location walkthrough, the first of a whole month of similar programming uh, an experiment for us, an experiment for you, an experiment for all of our, our, our visitors, all of our watchers, um, as we try to highlight um, really the full breadth of what we have to offer here at Old Salem and Mesta. Well, thank you so much, Daniel. It was great to be part of it. I really, you know, for me, it's I'm a kid in the candy shop having um, knowledgeable people like you that can walk me through all these beautiful pieces of furniture and having such an amazing collection. And thanks to everybody that took part of your Friday to join in. We had such a good time, and we'll be doing this um, every Friday for the whole month. And so come on back and see us again and enjoy the sunshine. I hope you got sunshine in your part of the world. Absolutely. Thank you so much, and have a great afternoon, everyone.